Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone. Today we have Cal Molinet. We're going to talk about how to communicate libertarianism and anarchism. Cal, how are you? I'm doing swell. <laughs> how are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. Before we get to uh, the discussion, tell me about how it was being in D.C., talking to people at the uh, March for Our Lives event. I would say uh, not even for the uh, March for Our Lives event that DC in front of the White House, there's a lot of protesters. There's a lot of people who have been doing this for a long time. They do weekly, monthly uh, sort of events there. And of course, that seems to be the go-to place for a lot of people who want change of some kind. Um, and so I find it to be an interesting venue, different uh, senior. I'm a DC native before I moved here to Richmond. So I've lived in DC for about uh, 15 years plus. So I'm quite familiar with the city. I love the city. Uh, if I didn't move here to Richmond, I'd start uh, Liberate DC, for example. Uh, so I like the scenery. I've always loved the city. Um, and it's just a different pace of uh, people to talk to. I mean, I'm still going to be doing it here in Richmond, but uh, versus VC college students where their opinions are not opinions are not yet formulated or concrete or have had them spend like over a decade uh, coming to those conclusions. Uh, I like the people outside of the White House because they have spent quite some time, considerable amount of time, even if they're wrong, <laughs> even if it feels over facts. It's just um, uh, you, you talk to a much older crowd of people, and I think that's a little bit more challenging and, and a lot more fun. And I think uh, the next area of where I'm doing my Spreading Anarchy series will be in front of the White House. Uh, so, yeah, March for Our Lives was uh, what's, what's to be expected. There's just a lot of people who don't really know what it is that they're arguing for or what it is they're advocating for. It's just... Uh, they see guns and they're fearful and they have PTSD when, you know, even just uh, looking at it, just like that one reporter who pulled the trigger, you know, and said, oh, my God, this is like PTSD. It's like firing a grenade launcher. Uh, so, you know, of course, when you ask them what a AR-15 stands for, the AR part, none of them know. Right. They say uh, assault rifle, er, wrong, armor light. That's the manufacturer. So it kind of behooves them to do some research. But, you know, that's uh, that takes time. That actually, you know, it takes work. And it's easier to just pair the line of your local liberal professor than to actually do some independent research. But uh, overall, it was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of good content material, of course. Uh, and I just always have a good time just arguing. So it's uh, it's great. I love it. So uh, in the description below, you can uh, find Cal's channel. He, he does such a great job with nonviolent communication and sort of like man on the street interviews. I'm curious, when... I can't wait for that spreading anarchy series. Uh, when when you're talking to a conservative versus a progressive, what different mechanisms or tools do you use to communicate the ideas of anarchism to people of those different types of uh, of beliefs? Uh, I would say I gauge uh, first their responsiveness, how they react to me. Uh, you know, and for the most part, if I come at them non-combative, they're not going to be as combative back towards me. Uh, so I kind of just gauge their attitude, gauge, gauge their, um, I guess, verbal cues, you can say. Um, and from there, I kind of set off. But usually my conversations with Republicans are a lot more fruitful, I would say, because uh, they already have I don't have to skirt around using the word capitalism or free market um, trigger words, you know, in terms of sometimes for liberals. And I could then just use that to see, like, who's the more capitalist? You know, isn't it more capitalistic to uh, let the free market uh, control and produce these services and goods that the government has monopolized, right? And uh, from there, usually most Republicans or conservatives already have view that a lot of taxation is already theft. Uh, so it's not that difficult to stretch it and universalize that uh, with principles, with logic, with that. And so I would say they're a lot more versed and um, some of the, most of the facts, I don't really have to go for the feels uh, kind of approach um, in terms of conservatives. And yeah, you know, I, I kind of enjoy that. Uh, with liberals, um, you kind of have to mix it up a lot more feels, a lot more of the uh, facts, but uh, it can be combative if I wanted it to be. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not really my uh, end game for a lot of this stuff. My end game is mostly just trying to help them understand that uh, you know, they've mis mis been uh, misled, right? For the most part, we've all been misled. And there's a lot of anarchists that have come to this position from all over, many different backgrounds, being extremely hardcore pro-socialist, uh, uh, progressive now to being pro-gun, uh, pro-free market. And uh, I know quite a number of them. So uh, so it's not uh, uh, different tactics, yeah, for different people, know your audience. Uh, and that's going to be that difficult. But of course, you know, we go to a March for Our Lives, March for Our Lives uh, protest, well, all, generally all of them are going to be liberals. So uh gives you, again, again more of a, an idea of where you're putting yourself into. 
All right. So one of the major things that uh, that conservatives and, pro and progressives uh, actually do justify the state on is we need a state to help the poor. How do you talk to people when making the libertarian anarchist case that helping the poor uh, would be best done in a libertarian anarchist society? There's uh, <laughs> history. I remind them of history. Uh, so then there used to be factual evidence where this, the society at large provided that for themselves. Uh, and these are the sort of things that are not included in textbooks, friendly societies, mutual aid societies, black fraternities, all these numerous groups in the past before the uh, Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, on, on, on people that uh, were provided uh, freely, voluntarily, uh, with no extortion uh, needed or involved until the government saw that. And the last thing that they wanted is that kind of independence from government. So, you know, those are the first thing you kind of want to attack, right? And that's so much of the government, the state wants to attack the family unit and dissolve it and break it up so that way the state is their family they also seek out to you know disrupt any kind of independence from government uh from the state and so what they did then is send out the code enforcers tax enforcers license enforcers and uh got rid of uh, just about all of them you know threaten them threaten the doctor to continue your medicine practice this building that you build for the for the people for your community uh, you know it's not up to code it's going to cost a lot of money to redo if you continue you can risk your practice or your livelihood uh be put at risk and with that out of the way that's where your medicare medicaid and social security and all those pro programs came in so it's not so much that uh they feel like we won't uh help the poor uh if they look in the past that people have helped the poor that's how they helped one another uh and it did exist and that is a fact uh and there's numerous evidence to show that but that's not something that uh they know about and that's where i go you know i can't people ask like how do you have so much patience talking to a lot of these people it's like i can't get angry over people's lack of knowledge of things, right? <laughs> like I can't get angry at my uh, siblings for not knowing things and I can't get angry at other people for not being presented with this knowledge and information. Uh, so I can have patience for that and helping them learn. Um, you know what they do with that information afterwards when they when they have it and they studied it and they still continue. Yeah, maybe you can uh, up the um, uh, the discussion a little more, more aggressively. Uh, but first time around, you know, I give everyone a chance to kind of digest it because this is uh, like 1984. They do a good job erasing uh, facts, history. Uh, they rewrite it all the time. So I think that's uh, kind of an important approach to take when uh, talking to other people. They just don't know, right? So no need to take it personally. Now, also when it comes to helping the poor, the major thing that mostly leftists focus on is healthcare. They imagine that currently the state is pretty much hands off on health care in America and and that's why prices are so high and everything. How do you communicate to people that something as necessary as health care should be totally voluntary? Well, I remind them that, uh, you know, if they care about health, right, there's a lot of things the government does that kind of uh, threatens that health, uh, the livelihood, you know, your life <laughs> at the end goal, you know, you want to live a long, fulfilling life with health, good health. But it doesn't help if government threatens that good health with uh, with guns and throwing people into cages for victimless crimes. Um, so, and it was easy to first point out that government itself is not really in the vested interest to uh, care for good health, right? If they have to threaten their health, especially at gunpoint through taxes, uh, through many numerous laws. Uh, the second point would be to remind them again of the the history, mutual aid societies. They provided all these kind of uh, communal health cares for for each other, and. I would say then um, the third part would be, uh, you know, throw in some facts. You know, for example, there's a, a state government limit on the amount of doctors there can be. And so with that kind of limit, you create that kind of uh, asphyxiation um, in the market of the of the doctors, of supplies of doctors out there. So, of course, when you limit doctors, there's not going to be that many doctors. And, of course, whereas the opposite were to occur, government limit on the amount of doctors there can be. You know, the abundance of doctors will lower prices, right? So one of the reasons why prices are so high is because government limits the amount of practices there can be doctors that can be out there. So it's not uh that's not the market. <laughs> that's not uh that's, that's the state doing that uh, very thing that uh it, it purports to 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 do to pr provide healthcare when they stifle it. Yeah, I remember first learning about certificate of need laws, which is literally competitors getting together to see if a new competitor can come and compete with them within a certain political area, whether it's a state or a city or a county. And I just and that just brought me down the rabbit hole of how often the state actually is the hurdle 
to getting healthcare, where it's like you have the provider and the patient who want to get together. They want to trade. The patient wants the goods. The producer wants to trade them for money. But the state is constantly getting the way in the way at everywhere we look. What? Uh, how do you respond to people who fear that um, with government they sort of have a say? Politicians can bend to the whim of the masses, whereas without a state, big business would take over. Uh, I mean, what what is it that a big, big businesses will take over, right? If you acknowledge their business and businesses are like subscription based fee, and at any time you can cancel or subscribe, it's like that's not really much of a, a threat or a frightening scenario. You know, start, uh, Planet Starbucks, you know, it won't be doesn't point guns at people, you know, to work for them. A lot of people say this is waste slavery, but you know, there's no gun that uh, Walmart points at its uh, employees to come there to work for them, right? But there is a gun by government that forces you to work one third of the entire year just to pay taxes. And so, you know, there's there's the gun uh, when that situation is put into place, when the state involves itself. But the state likes to purport itself to be a business in every turn of corner. It's, uh, it's, it's that wolf in sheep's clothing. It likes to borrow a lot of phrases from the market uh, here in Virginia, for example, or and you could say uh, USPS. So it purports itself sometimes to say, well, you know, we're not a government agency. We, uh, we make our own money. We're a private group. But that's not true because they have a monopoly on first class mail. No one's allowed to compete against USPS and their monopoly on first class mail, delivering pieces of paper. UPS, FedEx, all of them can deliver packages, but and none of them can price themselves lower than USPS. There's laws against that as well. Uh, but USPS also is, they're in billion dollars in debt. They borrow money in the millions. You look at their uh, annual, um, the, the report, annual rep income report, and you'll find that, you know, uh, how much money in the t t tens of millions sometimes that they've borrowed from the government at nearly zero interest fees. Uh, th these are loans that no other business have access to, right? So you can't tell me that that they're private and of course they'll use that phrase because people do like you know those small and pop businesses people like the kind of entrepreneurship and people like then the government will then like to pretend their business too to kind of garner that kind of support only when it benefits them you know and if it doesn't you know they'll lambast big businesses and corporations and all those other people and put the blame and shift onto them but yeah i, I would say um you know it's like uh abc government in the state of virginia has a monopoly on liquor and they say, yeah, thank you so much for your patronage. It's like, I can't go anywhere else, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a real business. Yeah, and as far as uh, the postal ser service goes, when Lysander Spooner tried competing with them to meet consumer demand in a more effective way, they just legally put him out of business. They didn't right. even argue. So the idea that the state's there for the consumer, the person forcing you to buy their product is not there for you. Uh, that's incredible that that has to be said. Right. Uh, communicating with conservatives, they often say that war is the result of foreign aggressors aggressing against America. And on such a large scale, you need a state to deter and or combat those enemies. How do you talk to conservatives who say that war justifies the necessity of a state? Uh, well, you can start off, uh, you know, the state is war unpeaceful people it has been from the very beginning when um you know you can say well you know we're overthrowing a uh, tyranny and uh the american revolution the british government and we saw that as a tyranny to overthrow and you saw them as war on, on people on the americans here but then you saw quickly how uh the politicians did that very same thing here to americans you saw george washington with his uh whiskey rebellion you know shutting down people for not collecting taxes and declared war on peaceful people you have uh, John Quincy Adams. Uh, you have uh, numerous hosts of people who are like uh, the Aliens and Seditions Act. You know, you can't have freedom of speech to uh, you know criticize people, right? Uh, and you have uh, Lincoln suspending habeas corpus, throwing people in jail for people who disagreed with him and his uh, political viewpoints in all of Maryland and D.C. So, yeah, uh, government is war on people. If you disagree with government, if you try to run away, escape, when they say that you owe them something, you know, you'll be chased after with guns. You'll be thrown into a cage. If you try to escape, you'll be murdered, right? That's this is. On a grander scale, it's organized war, but at the individual level, it's, it's it is war on on people, uh, especially here in the United States. But they also forget that uh, the government has no obligation to protect uh, people. Right? You have many Supreme Court rulings: Warren versus District of Columbia, DeShaney versus Winnebago County. A lot of areas in which the police fail to respond, the government fail to respond, and the Supreme Courts, uh, the judges have decreed and said that yeah, there's no obligation to protect life, liberty, or property. So if there's no obligation to do that, then you're force the taxation to fund a, a service in which they don't have to provide, right? Um, so, I mean, while it is war 
on people, it's also war on uh, keeping the charade up. Uh, you have to call it differently. You know, you can't call it a uh, theft. You have to call it taxes. But at the same time, uh, if the charade were up, you know, people will see the government for what it is, kind of like any other mafia group. But look at the situation at the Bundy Ranch when, um, you know, the argument there was property rights. And the government couldn't come out with more of a better justification to argue against that. And you had voluntary militia groups uh, converging to the Bundy Ranch. And they had rifles. They had uh, all kinds of guns pointed at government agents. Uh, and, you know, the first time, I wouldn't imagine that happened and the government's not firing back, right? And they, they stood down. Government backed off. Um, so while it is war on people, it's a war that they have to hide and call it by a different name. Uh, it's an indirect war. Uh, they can't really openly sit, call it war for now. But um, because if they did, you know, you'll have all those voluntary militia groups. You know, it's the most well armed uh, civilian population group in the world. And a lot of them are veterans, too. So, uh, you know, it'd be a huge mess for them. So I would say conservatives only say that because they're unaware of the fact that government has no obligation to protect life, liberty and property. Um, and then when you analyze what is taxation, right, that's not. You know, you're going to threaten your life, liberty, property in order to protect your life, liberty, property is, is an inconsistent, illogical uh, concept to hold at the same time. Yeah, it's so unbelievable that there wasn't. Look, by the way, Don Lemon called uh, the Bundys a terrorist organization. And um, but but as far as uh, Warren v. District of Columbia, that that just totally refutes the idea of a social contract. It's like obligation on one party, no obligation on the other. Like I cannot imagine like a, 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 an Olive Garden saying you have to pay us whether we bring you food or not. Like it's so ridiculous. The fact that people can't hold that standard to the state is is incredible. I'm curious, what was the best argument uh, it, when you were at the March for Our Lives event? What was the best gun control argument you got from someone there and how did you respond to it? The best one. Um, I know it's a very low bar. It kind of reminds me of um, this. Uh, a friend told me that she was talking to this communist and this guy who was a communist said um, the reason why he advocates communism is because he hates people. And uh, and it's, he finds it to be the most efficient way to get rid of people, which kind of makes sense. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And that's and that's the only reason he's a communist. Um, so maybe some of these people have I don't, I don't know if there's some kind of perverse fantasy that they hate people, and you know you see that history has a long pattern of seeing government uh, register people who have guns and then take them away and then slaughter them wholesale. Um, you know maybe one of them have that kind of same opinion and opine in that uh, they hate people and the best way to get rid of people is to have government confiscate their guns so uh, you can have this wholesale slaughter of peaceful people and uh, so I, I wouldn't say there's a I like how sometimes they they try to trick you and say you know I'm a gun owner myself you know it's like you know what, what are you doing here dude <laughs> or you know um, but there's not I don't think there's a position, any position I've come across is like, oh, oh my God, yeah, I must uh, entertain that for a little bit because um, they don't really provide any kind of facts. You know, if they did, they'd know handguns uh, kill more people than uh, rifles, right? Or if you ask them what is a, uh, yeah, what is an assault rifle? What, why, what makes it an assault rifle? Uh, they don't know. They know. It's a military grade weapon. It's like, no, oh, they also carry knives and they also have um, uh, M9 Berettas. I, I had to carry a Beretta, uh, M9 millimeter Beretta pistol when I was in the military. So you know, is that an assault handgun too? Cause they sell them freely all over the place. Uh, so that means all handguns have to be gone to pretty much all guns. But um, I think a lot of this stuff just comes from the media and the media has done a good job sensationalizing this to make it seem like it's happening all over the place. It's a very uh, constant threat to be wary of. But when I mean, you look at the facts and statistics, these kinds of mass school students have come down considerably um, over the past two decades. It's not a uh, on the rise uh, crime in general and the whole world has been going down. So. I know, it's almost boring to keep bringing up, but the fact that these th these people there, they tend to be anti-Trump progressive leftists. And just like a couple weeks ago, they're like the guy in charge of government is a racist, sexist, psychopath, Hitler light, and cops are an inherently racist institution. By the way, all of the, they're the ones who should have all the guns and they should have a single payer monopoly on health care. Like, I, I can't believe that this isn't pointed out. Like CNN's on 24 hours a day and not one of them has thought to bring that up, even though well, 
that's made constantly on places like Twitter or Facebook. It keeps getting pointed out, but the, the, they can't face that contradiction staring them right in the face. What about regulation? Regulation on businesses. So even if you say, well, yeah, the free market's generally good, but we sort of need the state to regulate them on behalf of the consumer. How do you uh, convince people that a libertarian anarchist society uh, regulation would be met better there than it would uh, on behalf of the state? <clears throat> so regulations among businesses is, um, you know, we say regulations, um, they're just trying to weed out uh, inefficiencies, right? They want to run business as smooth as possible, as uh, cost prohibitive as possible, and uh, so that the expenses don't accrue. And when you have a lot of problems, when you have a lot of complaints, that, that drives up uh, the cost of doing business. And with business to business also is a big marketplace share that, um, that takes place. And there's a lot of rules uh, and uh, contracts that they have with one another to uh, ensure the flow of business if there are uh, sort of disputes among them as well. So regardless of like our relationship with the state and other businesses, businesses and businesses themselves, like insurance companies, have a lot of rules that, that's already in two, put into place among each other uh, in the event that their client uh, injures one of the other clients to make this very fast because time is money. Uh, and, and they resolve these sort of matters uh, rather quickly, efficiently, you know, versus going to a court case with the state for something criminal. And that can, you know, take years. And doesn't necessarily have to take that long. Actually, you know, civil cases and uh, criminal cases actually should be the same thing, right? It's a violation of property rights, uh, you know, but these are things in which the state kind of interjects themselves uh, to be an arbitrator when, you know, without any um, input or uh, of interest of the people. They just force themselves into those kind of situations. Uh, but you can look at it places like uh, eBay, PayPal, um, and the use of you know, misappropriation of funds, somebody who, you know, hacks into your account at uh, Bank of America, for example, and you report it, you know, they'll credit you back the money and they'll send it to their investigation fraud team, right? Uh, you know, whether if you, whereas if you report that to the police, call 911, you know, there's nothing they'll do. You know, you won't see that money. Um, and and that's, that's about it. They'll, they'll take down a report, but, you know, that's as far as it gets for them. So the market has done, uh, I would say, a considerable good job and creating... Um, I want to call it regulations, just maybe uh, forms, rules of efficiency uh, in terms of, uh, you know, people say regulations, I call them, when government says these are regulations, what the government does is actually market restrictions. They restrict the flow of efficiencies of how businesses can interact with their customers and with one another. Uh, and that sort of costs, when you look at this uh, recent uh, Rupert report, has cost, um, I believe, like over 60%. You know, this is why you're like over 60% uh, poorer today. Uh, because over decades of market restrictions that the government has placed because these restrictions add up, the costs add up, and uh, that has to go somewhere, and that goes to the prices and salaries of uh, everyone else. They can't build a government. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, um, not that I think, I mean, there's evidence for that. High, high trust societies and uh, anarchist uh, community helps too. Uh, you know, you find, uh, you, know, you look at um, places like in Japan, uh, crime and stuff like that is not extensively high, but they have a high trust society. A lot of them have the same kind of culture. Uh, you know, they have that kind of internal efficiency of rules that they already understand, and it's not kind of foreign um, or or the worldly to them. Uh, and I think that helps a lot too. And I would say here in the United States, Western culture has a good uh, high trust in terms of that and the values that we share. It uh, makes it easier for. Uh, transactions and trade online even to to get through which is which is amazing which is great Pete, somebody i've never met um and you can have the rating system rating systems are a great thing towards that you try to do a rating system with the government you know it'll always be like negative one or negative half a star <laughs> you're the approval ratings of these politicians you know down like a little lower than 10 uh, percent, and, and still they're they're still in office right you know uh and they can't shut down whereas any other business will go bankrupt you know so and worst of all, they call themselves representatives like they represent. It's absolutely sickening. Two more right. quick questions. The ethics of emergencies often come up. They'll say the entire state is justified and the welfare state's justified and aggression is justified because if I'm starving, I can initiate aggression to take someone else's food to save my own life. Therefore, the state is justified in doing those things which would arise in emergencies to avoid them. How do you communicate to someone who responds to the state is illegitimate because ethical emergency? 
Yeah, that's a good one. The um, I'm starving, so I could break into your house, <laughs> raid your fridge. If you get in my way, I get to hurt you. That's perfectly fine. You know, hey, I got cats to feed. Um, but you find that uh, these situations of starvation, famine, uh, emergency situations uh, occur in um, countries going to that uh, dead end zone of socialism. Um, you know, inevitably, it's these are unfunded liabilities. You have the economic calculation problems, and it will collapse early. But uh, the ones that have uh, sped their way through that finish line, um, like on a nitro boost like uh, Venezuela, you have that situation. And now it's not the market's fault. That's the government's fault. That's socialism's fault. That's, uh, you know, you look at Mao's uh, China, the government's centralization of uh, production of agriculture, um, you know, create, created the, the great famine out there, you know, tens of millions dead. Parents uh, eating their, their children, uh, their sons and daughters just to survive, uh, cannibalize them. And so you find time again, the pattern of history when you find these emergency situations are happening in these deep-seated socialist countries uh, that inevitably fail and inevitably create those kinds of uh, conditions in which, yeah, uh, people are at each other's throat. There is this more of a night of uh, the living dead um, in which they're just tearing at everything. In Venezuela, they're tearing at zoos uh, to the animals there. Uh, whereas here, whatever's left that we have of capitalism um, before it's all gone, you know, uh, there's no one starving. In the United States, the only reason anyone is starving in the United States is maybe out of a uh, mental illness or uh, parental neglect for the children. Right here, we have such a great abundance of food that you know you can go to McDonald's for a dollar and have they say like the most nutritional in terms of calories and what's in it uh, at a price. Uh, you have uh, dozens and dozens of food banks. Churches play a great role in that philanthropy, and you know you have anyone really. If you ask, hey, I'm starving, really hungry. Can can you can I get something to eat? People say, yeah, sure. You know, uh, you know, we could go to any 7-Eleven. You know, this, these things happen all the time. Um, so there's no one starving unless it's willful starvation or parental neglect or mental illness. But for the most part, there's plenty of plenty of food here. Uh, whatever cup of capitalism that we have here in this country has done a good job <laughs> of raising that. But if you want, really want to see those kinds of examples, then, you know, go to Venezuela, go to a socialist country. You know, do a trade, trade, trade a capitalist for a socialist sort of thing, right? Swap them out. And I would say that... Uh, you know, when you ask them that, you know, if I'm starving, you know, why, why don't you ask, you know, hey, uh, it's kind of funny in those extreme scenarios. Uh, you're not allowed to ask people for help. Right. That's, that's not an option for them. Uh, you, you have to raid someone's house. You have to go in their Mad Max battle. You have to kick down the door, shoot their dog and, you know, steal their uh, lettuce and uh, ramen noodles from the fridge. Uh, you can't knock and say, hey, um, I'm really hungry, dude. Can you help me out? You can't do that. That's not an option in those kind of scenarios. Uh, you can't uh, ask your friends. You can't ask a church. You know, you, you can't work for a job. I think that's like an awesome thing you can do. Right trade for food right no no in those scenarios that's not allowed and that's not permissible so these are sometimes like fantasies uh, of children that they have of extreme examples that that don't happen um in like in a well kind of abundant rich society as such as here in the united states um but they do happen in uh the dead end of hell's hell's hellscapes of socialism towards that end like venezuela and other places that government has uh created that kind of famine and starvation, like in Ukraine, uh, hold them more famine, uh, led to the millions of people, uh, dying, you know, uh, purposefully man-made. Yeah. If status just took that imagination they had for emergency ethics, like they have such the, these wild imaginations about what would happen in the absence of a coercively funded monopoly, but they like cannot imagine how roads could be paved in the absence of a ruling class. It, it's so selective. And the case of Venezuela, where it's like they have so much oil and the world wants oil and there's people starving there or Ukraine was known as the breadbasket of Europe before the Soviet Union invaded it. And there was a starvation in the breadbasket of Europe. Only governments can, can create these things. Uh, finally, one last question. What is, if you could have everyone in the world read one book, uh, what would that book be? <laughs> one book, huh? Uh, Henry Hazlitt's uh, Economics in One Lesson, I think is a good primer, uh, good understanding of uh, many of these subjects, and it's uh, freely available. You can go to, uh, I believe, uh, Fee has it uh, on the website, and or you can kind of find, find it anywhere. But I think it's uh, economics is, is a good place to understand these sort of things. Uh, and that's not something that uh, government values and treasures themselves to have people have a good understanding. Because if they did, you know, you would have more of a commercial marketplace value of your high school diploma. After, what, 12 years of government schooling, you'd think that you'd be worth a little bit more than, um, you know, 
minimum wage, as they say. Um, so yeah, Henry Hallett's Slits, uh, Economics in One Lesson is a good, great, great, fantastic place to start. That is the same exact book Stefan Kinsella recommended when I spoke uh, <laughs> with him on my channel. So you, you, great minds obviously think alike. I remember reading in that book where he distinguishes the voluntary, the public sector being the coercive sector and the private sector as the voluntary sector. That was just a total mind opening moment. And I was a conservative at the time. So, uh, yes, I absolutely recommend that th that book as well. I would say uh, uh, Stefan Kinsella's book uh, Against Intellectual Property would be among my personal top 10. Uh, and so, you know, I'd add that to the, my top 10 list. So, yeah, he's got a great uh, essay book on the subject as well. Cal, thanks so much for, uh, for, for doing this interview. I really appreciate your time. Give us your YouTube channel and uh, your, Twitter, your Twitter handle and uh, anything else uh, you, want, you want to let my audience know. Yeah, you can find me on YouTube on uh, under my name, Cal Moline, K-A-L-M-O-L-I-N-E-T. Um, my tribe, the group of anarchists that I hang out with here in Richmond is uh, Liberate RVA. RVA stands for Richmond, Virginia. And yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to talk. It's always fun uh, to discuss uh, anarchism, philosophy, and, and, and the like. Um, so yeah, stay liberated, Keith. Thanks so much. Take care.